you're well known for taking an international approach to the history of political thought. Um, I think you say in the beginning of this volume that this is a third in a kind of loose trilogy of books on the subject. Um, and this book contains chapters on uh, both methodology and chapters that are based on archival research. Um, so I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about what the international is for you, how you conceptualise it, and how it's informed your work. Mm. Well, thank you for so much for this opportunity to talk about the book, Julia. It's a delightful uh, to be here. When I think about uh, what I now call, and other people are calling, international intellectual history, I think of that as working in two directions. The, uh, the intellectual history of the international and an intellectual history which has gone international or moved into international spheres. So the intellectual history of the international is thinking about the concepts, the language, the ideas that have been used to, to think about and to argue about the international realm, to think about the relations between states, to think about the justification of international organizations, to think about the relations between individuals and collectivities in the international sphere. It's only very recently we've begun to excavate that language as a historical object of study. On the other side, we have uh, an intellectual history which has gone international in the sense that it breaks down uh, the borders between um, nationally defined fields or maybe fields defined by particular languages to look at the exchanges and the circulation of ideas, sometimes the physical circulation of ideas in the forms of books and manuscripts, how they're carried through individual agents or actors, but also how they're projected through international organizations all the way from early modern corporations or missionary societies through to international bodies like NGOs or international organizations like the United Nations and similar uh, institutions in the contemporary world. And those two things have to be put together. I think the language excavated historically of the international along with the glo ultimately global circulation mm. of that language to make what we call now international intellectual history. Mm. And is this the way that you would conceptualise kind of the difference between international and transnational, these two different ideas? Yes, I mean, I, I think it's helpful to have international as, as the, uh, the switching point between these two forms of history because it allows us to think both about the transnational and the international in the sense that the international tends to mean, though it doesn't exclusively mean, um, those aspects of relations which uh, deal with state relations, relations between collectivities, um, whereas the transnational tends to go in many multiple different directions. Uh, cultural exchanges, exchanges of individuals, the movement of goods and products, as, uh, but also biota and disease, uh, anything that crosses national borders or goes above national borders. So I think the international is a helpful switching point, but uh, I'm not tremendously invested in purely definitional disputes. I uh, want to be more eclectic and inclusive, so the transnational and the international can get along just fine. Thank you very much. <laughs> Um, so I suppose for the most part this book would seem to be um, an attempt at the former mm -hmm. of the two uh, types of uh, kind of international intellectual history that you just defined. Um, it treats, you know, mainly uh, kind of canonical thinkers and themes from the history of political thought, so Hobbes, Locke, Bentham, ideas of natural and positive law. Um, so. I was wondering why you think it's taken so long for this to happen. Um, That's a very interesting question. I mean, it's, it's a personal question why it took me so long to finally to produce this book, which I began thinking about more than a dozen years ago, uh, but also uh, why it suddenly happened relatively recently. I think uh, the talk of globalization, uh, all of the talk in the late 90s in particular about the, the end of the state, the dissolution of the state, going beyond the state, obviously had an impact on this, the increasing salience of not just formal international organizations like the UN and its agencies, but also the proliferation of NGOs in the lives of many people around the world have really focused a lot more attention across popular imagination as well as in the social sciences, including history on these international aspects of life in the last generation or perhaps less than a generation on the other hand. But also I think uh, the history of political thought to be more precise, perhaps even parochial, um, has been generally defined by a particular version of the political. 
let's say, the political as it takes place in the polis or the commonwealth, looking at the inside of the various human communities organized politically uh, that have been constructed through history and have been conceptualized and justified and argued about through history, but thinking about such matters as citizenship and sovereignty in the context of bounded communities. Um, that's obviously a very large, absolutely central agenda which has driven the history of political thought, quay the history of conceptualizations of the polis, but that to a large extent excluded thinking about how commonwealths, states, polis interacted with each other. And I think that's, that's the next agenda to think outside the boundaries of sovereignty to the construction of sovereignty in uh, the international realm where states meet, to think about uh, citizenship as something that's transnational as well as national, uh, to think about all these other is issues as being generated by often the interaction of the internal and the external, and indeed something that I write about in the book is how indeed those very categories, the internal and the external, the domestic and the foreign, have emerged over time. It seems to me that's one of the central questions that was elided by always looking at the inside, the domestic, the internal. Uh, but once you put these two realms together, you begin to wonder, well, where, where did they emerge from? Where did that division emerge from since before the 17th century? Nobody's really talking in those terms about the inside and the outside of states. So um, I think, therefore, there are internal reasons to the field of politi history of political thought that have generated this now as the next logical step, uh, and then also external pressures as so often that these two things come together. All history is the history of the present. In some ways we need to rethink our categories and I mean, a, third, a third aspect which is personal but I think more general as well as the circulation of scholars. We're all mo more mobile, we're all more interconnected now, so uh, our very movements as scholars uh, often um, sensitize us more to the international realm than when the academic world was a little more static, mm. nationally focused. Mm. I think certainly in my own case, moving to the US, thinking broadly about these things from different contexts, spending more time outside the Atlantic world, going into visiting Australia, Japan, and so on, you begin to think in very different ways about the, um, the scales on which history happens and the concepts which have been used to understand that. I was actually going to ask whether you thought that the, uh, the American context had uh, kind of informed your work uh, mm -hmm. or it was mm -hmm. more receptive to this kind of history than uh, a British context was. Um, well, I think in some ways a British context is, uh, it has been more fertile for many scholars in this area just because a lot of this intersects obviously with the professional interests of international relations scholars and IR scholars in in Britain, especially those who relate to the so-called English School of International Relations, have always taken uh, history and uh, political theory much more seriously than other schools of uh, behaviorally, scientifically inflected international relations, especially in the US have. So I think in, in many ways the conversations that this work emerges from have a stronger background academically in Britain, even though another factor to answer your earlier question, that a certainly sharpened interest in these things was foreign American foreign policy in the early part of the 20th century, especially in the aftermath of 9-11. Uh, that focused a great deal of attention on uh, the justifications for uh, external force, intervention, the new forms of warfare, uh, the dissolution of sovereignty, etc., 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 in ways that I think have been very productive for historians also to go back and investigate uh, all of these uh, concepts to look at um, the, the sources of our current confusions about some of these central arguments and conceptions. So I think that again, uh, in the US context, just the very fact of uh, a brutal, perhaps imperial foreign policy of intervention yeah. uh, helped to sharpen a focus on uh, the justifications for uh, these kinds of activities through history, not a coincidence. Yeah, um, and uh, continuing on from you know, this kind of idea of uh, uh, nations and states, I suppose, um, Foundations of Modern International Thought deals extensively with international law and the state system and how, the ways in which states constituted themselves, for instance, by the Declaration of Independence, as you write. Uh, so, uh, kind of building on what you were talking about with the US uh, previously, I wonder if you could say a little more about where the nation and nationalism fit into this approach? Mm. Well, I think in my own formation, when I was beginning my uh, work as a historian in the early 90s, 
Uh, that was very much the moment when nationalist movements, especially in Eastern Europe after 1989, uh, were beginning to sharpen the focus of citizens but also um, academics on uh, the politics and the polemics of nationalism. At that point, not just in Eastern Europe, though much of the fundamental conceptual work came from there or came from scholars who were affiliated there, but also had obvious uh, context then, for instance, in relation to Scottish nationalism and independence in, in the 90s, Catalan independence, etc., etc., etc. I was very allergic to that, I have to say, when I was a graduate student. I thought the one thing that was missing from that as nationalism, discussions of national identity, blanketed the academic landscape, was a discussion of the other side of the strange centaur, the nation state, uh, that nationalism, if it has any definition, and I think this is actually Weber's definition of nationalism, is the aspiration of self-identifying peoples or nations to occupy a state, to have their own state, to have a territorial stake, to have sovereignty, to define their, their borders, to define their identity within uh, a sovereign territorial again, Weberian state. Uh, and I, all, I thought from the very beginning of my work that that was missing from these discussions. So I've actually had very little interest in nationalism. I got quite a lot of flack when I published my book on the Declaration of Independence that it was not about the nation. I said very specifically, this is about the state and states and the emergence of states. It's not about nationhood. It's not about national identity. It's not about nationalism. Um, and I still think that's, that's the really big question. Uh, late 18th century, maybe, I don't know what the estimate would be, one-tenth of the Earth's surface is occupied by uh, political organizations that we might recognize as states, in, again, in the Weberian sense. Now, uh, in 2013, every part of the Earth, except for Antarctica, uh, and some anomalies, the exceptions, the states of exception created uh, by states themselves, like Guantanamo Bay, every part of the Earth's surface is occupied by a state. That seems to me an enormous shift in world history. Um, everybody in, on the Earth now uh, has a state, except for unfortunate stateless people who would wish to have some attachment to a state. There are very few self-conscious cosmopolitans who want to exit from that universal uh, embrace of the state. Uh, and I, I'm still astonished that uh, that doesn't attract more attention. I'm hoping that this book might, it's the third attempt I'm making to get people to think about that and talk about that. Let's hope it's successful. Third time lucky, perhaps, yes. this time. Yes. <laughs> um, how, how then do people who, um, in this system of states where rights are really attached to the state um, and defined by the state, and you say, you know, uh, so many people want to be part of a state, and you, you talk about this in the chapter on the Declaration of Independence, how they, um, uh, people trying to, be try to became, become part of this law of nations, mm -hmm. um, or kind of the state system, through performing and conforming to the language of the system itself. Um, but what about people who reject the system completely, or well, they want to have no part of it? So where do, uh, you know, the, I'm thinking of the Iroquois or Bedouins or um, people who aren't interested in joining a kind of defined state system, how do they fit into it? Well, I think that's, that's a very important part of the story that especially legal historians, but also historians of indigenous peoples are beginning to excavate now are the ways in which um, the universalizing of the state form forces these kinds of choices, um, not least because exclusion from the state system comes with very large disadvantages in terms of um, recognition, in terms of the representativeness of voices, but also on the flip side um, creates very important new forms of creativity uh, to create uh, global economic organizations linking indigenous peoples together outside a capitalistic system dominated by states and interarticulated very firmly with the UN system, for instance, to think creatively about ways to escape from the prison house of statehood and everything that goes along with that are important for organized peoples like this, but then also think, think about it from the other from other different directions. Think about uh, terrorists who are ranged against the state, uh, trying to attack the state system, thinking in terms of uh, global civil war on the state system itself. Uh, think about the new forms of strategy which even states themselves are obviously having to generate against non-state actors in that way. Uh, think about, as 
of domestic or para-domestic political position. Anarchism itself is something which works against uh, the state, assumes the, the disappearance of the state or tries to imagine other kinds of self-organization at the individual or the local level. Something I've just written a short piece about is uh, the necessity of international relations theory to start thinking uh, about the relevance of anarchist political theory for international relations. How can non-state actors organize themselves from below through the kinds of strategies and practices we associate with inter-individual anarchism, for instance, to think about international anarchy not as something that's always branded as negative, destructive, ranged against order and sovereignty, but actually ranged against sovereignty as a new form of order, as an alternative form of order. I think um, the confluence of the history of political thought, political theory, and the international realm opens up these remarkable possibilities for new forms of thinking, not just beyond the state, but beyond the state system, which we've barely begun to imagine, but the yeah. resources are all there in the history of political thinking for that. Yeah. That's very interesting, because I mean, often it seems, you know, globalization, obviously it gives people so much more choice, but at the same time, it, it locks people down into mm -hmm. a certain kind of system. It decreases fluidity, even as Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, people are given more choice. Um, I mean, I really think that this mode of kind of thinking internationally, rather than just looking for the international um, is uh, seems to really be a fantastic way to get around political thoughts, often problematic relationship with the international or the non-Western world, um, both of which have kind of not been taken very seriously, as you said, um, and shuffled to the sidelines in political thought often. Um, so finally, I wonder how you see the this kind of work that you've been doing in Foundations of Modern International Thought, which deals with the international dimensions of the Western canon as intersecting with work on, for example, empire or the non-Western political thought. I'm thinking of uh, Jennifer Pitts and C.A. Bailey's work, or even work on post-colonial methodology and historical difference, for instance, to Pierre Chakrabarty's provincializing Europe. Well, all of, all of the authors you mention and uh, many working in, in, in the fields that you mention uh, are very much in the background of my work. I recognize my own limitations, as you say, these are mostly canonical figures drawn entirely from the Western tradition, uh, but uh, some of the conversations that have already emerged from the book uh, and associated publications convince me that this is um, a methodology which is not just transportable, I don't want to think of this as kind of diffusionism out from a centre to peripheries, but, but more importantly hooks into and uh, cross-fertilises very strongly with these all, all other approaches as well, especially since they, they bring up alternatives to the emergent state system, uh, alert us to different conceptions of sovereignty, layered sovereignty, multiple sovereignties, divided sovereignty, even within some of the classic categories that we recognise uh, also in terms of the uh, international intellectual history in terms of circulations to, uh, to trace um, the emergence of ideas outside the West and their transportation, uh, interaction with Western ideas in colonial situations, something that uh, Chris Bailey, whom you mentioned, uh, very much worked on. Uh, recently there's a lot more of that uh, work beginning to emerge now. It goes well beyond my capacities, linguistic and otherwise, but uh, I think this is, the, uh, this is all very productive and what we need are more conversations bringing together students in different parts of the world and different periods crucially as well. We can take many of these conversations back at least to what we would call in the Western world the late Middle Ages and perhaps before uh, to do this over the long durée as well as over large expanses of space and to have more conversations to see what is typical, what's non-typical, uh, what's emerging simultaneously in morphologically recognizable parallel in different areas at different times and then coming into dialogue uh, to reconstruct that. I have great hopes that more of that kind of work uh, will take place. Um, and recognizing the limitations of my own work, uh, I'm glad that it's, it's had a good reception. I just did a forum, for instance, with a group of scholars mostly from uh, China and South Asia on part of the book, and that was uh, very salutary to get their responses of things that I had missed or larger parts of the, the global context for the particular examples I was giving that look very different from, say, an East Asian context. Uh, I think that's exactly the kind of dialogue that I'm I would want personally to be involved in, but I think this field uh, needs to be more engaged with, and I'm certain it will be uh, to everyone's benefit. Well, thank you very much for agreeing to be interviewed today, David Armitage. Thank, thank you, you so much, Julian. This was thank a great you. pleasure, as always. <laughs>